Hello, everyone, and good evening. Uh, we're incredibly happy to welcome you all today in the second session for this year on essentially everything about the rhythm component. My name is Nicole. I am a physiotherapist, and I am the physiotherapist advisor for the examinations program here at CAPR. I am joined today by one of my colleagues, Kelly. Kelly, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kelly Piazzatin. I am the lead psychometrician at CAPR. I'm pleased to be joining Nicole this evening to be sharing important information about the PCE written component. Awesome. So we're both again very happy to host Canadian and internationally trained candidates in this session. We're joining us from many different parts of Canada and from other countries as well. So welcome everyone and thank you for making the time to join us tonight. Before we begin, we would for first like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which CAPR operates. The CAPR office is on a land that has been the site of human activity for 15,000 years. The Anishinaabemowin name for this area is Adobigok, which means the place of the alders. The name Etobicoke originates with the Mississauga First Nation, who called Etobicoke Creek and the area around it Adobe. Over time, the word was gradually corrupted and anglicized into Etobicoke, and finally Etobicoke. This is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This land was part of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabeg and Allied Nations, which held together the indigenous peoples of the Great Lakes before settlers appeared. It was later part of the Toronto Purchase, or Treaty 13 of 1805, negotiated between the British Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit. At CAPR, we recognize our accountability to Indigenous nations across Turtle Island and acknowledge these Indigenous nations for their guardianship of the land. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this territory. And just a few bits of housekeeping before we begin. These, the session is currently being recorded and it will replace the video that is currently available on our preparing for the exam webpage in the coming days, and it will also be available on the CAPR YouTube. So the recording of the last session is already there for everyone to view. So if you want to check this out, after, check that out after the session, you're free to do so. Um, everyone is muted, and your cameras. Oh, sorry, and your cameras will be turned off for the um, for the webinar, and this will be the case for the entirety of the session. So you won't be seen in the recording. And lastly, you will have the opportunity to ask questions at any time using the Q&A functions at the bottom of your screens. You're welcome to type your questions in English or French. But what we request though, is that you wait and pay close attention to the presentation first and ask questions only if there is something that is unclear or if there's something that we don't end up addressing. We will collect all of your questions at the end of this session and answer them in writing soon after. Um, a Q&A document from the session from last month is also already available on the website. So please feel free to check that as well as the answer to your question may already be there. So we will not be entertaining live questions in our session today, but if you did send um, a question through the Zoom registration ahead of time, we have tried our best to incorporate the answer within our session. If any other questions come to mind after the session, please check our website. All of the information that Kelly and I are presenting today are available there, or send an email to our exams program client services coordinator at csc underscore exams at alliancept.org, and we'll answer your questions via email as soon as possible. So you will see that there are a few clickable links on some of our slides as we go through our presentation today. A PDF copy of these slides is available on the website, again, on the preparing for the exam page. And you should be able to click on these links to access the relevant resources that we mentioned as we go through the presentation. Great. So what will we be talking about today? 
So we will start with a brief discussion about CAPR, about our roles, who we are, and what we do, because some do fully understand what our role is in the profession. So we hope to um, shed a bit more light on this during this talk. And of course, we will be discussing everything on the written component. We'll talk about the process before and after the exam, the exam structure and format, and we'll give you some information as well to help you prepare for the exam and some information about exam administration. We'll also be speaking about what happens after the exam. So how the exam is scored, how scores are reported, how scores are released, and the options that are available to you if you are unsuccessful in your exam attempt and what happens to you um, of what you need to do if you are successful. All right, so to start things off, we'll talk about the Canadian Alliance of Physiotherapy Regulators, which is the organization that Kelly and I work for. It is a nonprofit organization, and what that means is that the money that we need to perform our functions comes from the fees that we collect. We are a national entity that provides centralized evaluation, knowledge brokering, and policy services on behalf of our members. So our evaluation services function, it's widely understood as this involves credentialing and assessment. But people may be a bit less familiar with their knowledge brokering and policy services. And what that means is that we essentially provide a collaborative networking ability for our members and other partners for knowledge exchange and to decrease the duplication of work and create standardized processes for the profession. A common misconception that, um, that exists about CAPR is that we function in isolation. And one of the key things that we want you to take away is that we work closely with our stakeholders and partners. If you're interested to learn more about our knowledge brokering and policy functions, I encourage you to visit the publications page on the CAPR website. You'll see some of our work there, such as the Code of Ethical Conduct, which was developed along with the um, Canadian Physiotherapy Association, and the Core Standards of Practice for Physiotherapists in Canada, both of which are very valuable resources um, for preparing for the exam. Right. So who are our members? Our members are the Canadian Provincial and Territorial Physiotherapy Regulators that you may all know better as the colleges. So CAPR is the alliance of the 11 physiotherapy regulator members listed here on this slide. We also have one affiliate member, and that is the Federation of State Boards of Physical Therapy in the United States, or the FSBPT. And you may be familiar with them if you have looked into the NPT process, but they're definitely not as involved as our Canadian members. So CAPR is not a regulator. What we do is we, we provide services to the regulators, but we do not have any regulatory functions. So we do not get to decide who can become registered physiotherapists, or in other words, the credentialing and examinations process does not automatically give any individual the right to practice in Canada. Rather, what we do is we provide the evaluation outcomes to the physiotherapy regulators in each of the provinces, and the regulators then use the evaluation outcomes along with other eligibility criteria in considering applications for registration. So just to go briefly over some things that people tend to assume that we do, but we don't. The first is on licenses. We do not issue, spend, or reinstate licenses. We don't have anything to do with that. That is handled by the relevant regulatory college. We also do not set or waive entry to practice licensing requirements. These requirements are set by the regulators in accordance with legislation governing regulated professions. And lastly, we do not author we do not have authority over the regulators. We were created as a service provider and as a shared resource. All right. So we exist to support regulators in their function of ensuring that all physiotherapists who enter practice in Canada have at least the minimum level of competence required for safe and effective practice. So having a pan-Canadian approach to evaluation services ensures that the assessment of this required minimum competence level 
is standardized for all candidates entering practice in Canada. This approach also avoids bias or any perception of bias between candidates trained in different parts of the country or between candidates trained in Canada and internationally. It also enables labor mobility at, across jurisdictions, because as you all may likely know or prob probably can tell after being shown that slide with the list of the regulators, physiotherapy in Canada is regulated provincially, not federally. But the Canadian Free Trade Agreement requires that there must be open labor mobility across jurisdictions. So one of CAPR's functions is to help enable this by establishing national standards. So at the core of this, our uniting goal is public protection as well as protection of the profession. Right. So just to go into a bit more detail about this national approach to evaluation services before we talk about the exam, our evaluation services has two parts and that is credentialing and assessment. So the credentialing program at CAPR reviews the education and qualifications of physiotherapists educated outside of Canada to determine whether or not their education and training are substantially different from those of Canadian educated physiotherapists. If their education and training is deemed to be not substantially different from what Canadian educated physiotherapists receive, and they have met English or French language proficiency requirements and the knowledge of the Canadian healthcare context requirements, then they become eligible to apply for the written component of the PCE. You will see here that language proficiency is a clickable link, um, and that is because we recently update our language proficiency policy, and that is effective as of April 1st, 2023. So there are some changes to the tests that are accepted, cut scores in language skill areas and exempt countries. Um, so if you feel that you're affected by that, please check that link. Um, more details on this and any other credentialing questions, because we did receive a few, are not within the scope of this session. So if you are here and you need to learn more about credentialing, please visit the credentialing page on our website or send an email to the address on the slide. So credentialing is the first step for all internationally educated physios who want to practice in Canada. Um, Canadian educated candidates who were trained in an accredited entry to practice physio program do not have to go through this process. All right. So as for assessment, so CAPR administers the written component of the PCE for both Canadian and internationally educated physiotherapy candidates. And as you're likely aware, the PCE used to have two parts, a written and a clinical component. So currently, CAPR does not offer a clinical exam. However, a lot of work is um, currently underway to determine a new direction regarding our assessment processes for the coming years. And if you're curious about it, I've linked here our innovation agenda that you can review at your own time. All right. So to wrap up our CAPR overview, our guiding vision here is that every physiotherapist is a competent and ethical physiotherapist, and our mission is to support the physiotherapy community and protect the public. All right, Kelly, on to you. Thank you, Nicole. For the remainder of this presentation, we're going to be focusing on the written component. This is a multiple choice exam that tests your knowledge and understanding of the principles and processes of physiotherapy practice, as well as your ability to use and integrate clinical knowledge to solve clinical problems. The exam is computer based and administered at test centers across Canada, as well as through remote proctoring, which was introduced in 2020 in order to facilitate access to the exam during the pandemic. The exam has 200 multiple choice questions for which you have four hours to complete. So this gives you an average of about 1.2 minutes or 72 seconds to read and answer each question. Although you're probably going to find that some questions take a little bit less time to answer and some a little bit more. So it's important that you pace yourself so that you have sufficient time to answer all 200 questions. Each question on the exam consists of a STEM and four answer options. 
The stem is the introductory part of the item that presents the candidate with a question or problem. And candidates are then um, required to select the correct or the best answer option from a list of four alternatives. One is the correct answer and three are referred to as distractors. These are plausible options that are either incorrect or are not the best response given the client scenario. Approximately 90% of the questions accompany vignettes. Vignettes are short paragraphs that provide information about a client. For example, the age, signs and symptoms, diagnosis, history, etc. And then the series of questions that follow each vignette are based on information from that vignette. And the remainder of the items, approximately 10%, are standalone. These are independent questions not associated with any other questions on the exam. And the exam is structured such that all the vignette-based questions are presented first, followed by the standalone questions towards the end of the exam. So I'm going to show you some examples of what a vignette-based question looks like and a standalone. In this first example here, you can see the vignette in the first paragraph, followed by the first question, which includes a stem and four answer options. And note that each vignette typically includes between three and six questions, but in this example, we're just showing you one. And next we have an example of a standalone question, which includes just the stem and four answer options, but there's no other information that you would need to answer the question. We strongly encourage you to familiarize yourself with the types of exam questions that you can expect to see on exam day and to practice going through reading and answering the questions while timing yourself so that you can gauge how long you're taking to answer different types of questions. And later in today's presentation, Nicole is going to highlight some of the resources that CAPR has to help you prepare for the exam, including the Essential Guide for Candidates, and these questions are screenshots taken from that guide. Uh, we also have 50 practice items that you can access on our website. This slide here illustrates the processes involved in creating and maintaining a defensible licensure exam in accordance with international testing standards. The processes are broken down into eight stages, with each stage forming a link in the chain of psychometric defensibility. A defensible exam means that attention is placed on validity so that the exam measures what it intends to measure and exam results are interpreted correctly. It also means that attention is placed on fairness so that the exam experience is the same for everyone and all candidates have the same opportunity to demonstrate competence, as well as reliability so that the exam is consistent and repeatable. And as we speak about the written component in this session, I will be touching upon many of the exam stages noted in this illustration, starting with stage one, exam conceptualization and design, what is also commonly referred to as the blueprinting process. So for anyone who's not familiar with what a blueprint is or what purpose it serves, a blueprint is a document that outlines the essential elements to be covered by the exam and it specifies what proportion of the exam will cover each element. You can think of a blueprint like a recipe for the exam, specifying what needs to go into the exam and how much of it. And this ensures that every time an exam is administered, it's using that same recipe. And this also ensures that candidates are being tested on a representative sample of the competencies required at entry to practice. The blueprint is organized primarily under two dimensions, domains and areas of practice. So there are 140 entry to practice milestones listed in the blueprint. And these milestones are organized into one of seven domains. The bulk of the exam is comprised of content that falls into the physiotherapy expertise domain, up to approximately 60% of the exam. And this is the domain where most of the technical competencies are covered. Things like assessment, diagnosis, treatment planning, interventions, client safety, etc. Communication, collaboration, and professionalism each make up between 5 and 15% of the exam, 
so roughly 10 to 30 questions each. Communication tests your ability to use effective strategies to exchange information and enhance therapeutic and professional relationships. Collaboration focuses on skills for working effectively with others to provide inter and intra-professional care. And professionalism tests understanding of your roles and responsibilities within a regulated, um, self-regulated profession and your commitment to working ethically and in the best interests of clients and society and maintaining high standards of behavior. And next we have management, leadership, and scholarship. And each of these makes up between three and 7% of the exam or between six and 14 items. Management questions test your ability to manage your time, yourself, your resources and priorities to ensure safe, effective and sustainable services. Leadership questions are focused on skills for envisioning and advocating for a health system that enhances the well-being of your clients and society. And scholarship tests your commitment to excellence in practice through continuous learning, educating others, evaluating and using evidence, and contributing to professional scholarship. The blueprint also specifies the types of conditions that will be covered on the exam. And these conditions are organized into four areas of practice based on physiological systems, musculoskeletal, neurological, cardiovascular respiratory, and other. It's important that you familiarize yourself with the types of conditions that will be covered on the exam so you can ensure that you have knowledge and understanding of their etiology, pathophysiological mechanism, natural history, clinical presentation, prognosis, and management. Uh, a lot of registrants have asked about the breakdown of the exam. And this image above gives you that. It tells you the approximate number and percentage of questions that will be tested from each area of practice and on the previous slide from each domain. Note that the images I presented in the last two slides though, they're not the blueprint. It's just an overview of it. The blueprint is actually a very detailed document that will help you understand the exam better. And remember that your exam will assess a sampling of the entry to practice milestones and a sampling of the conditions in accordance with the parameters outlined in the blueprint. I wanted to give you an example of how questions on the exam are mapped to the blueprint. Each one of the 200 items on the exam are coded to one area of practice and one domain. In this example, you can see that the client in this question has a diagnosis of congenital muscular torticollis. So this question is coded to 1.1.14 congenital malformations, which is a condition listed within the musculoskeletal area of practice. The question also tests candidates' ability to identify the client's body structure and function impairments, which is an entry to practice milestone grouped within the physiotherapy expertise domain. And note that while the written component is balanced to match the blueprint requirements, the exam is not divided into different sections. For instance, we don't present all the MSK questions in one section followed by the neurological questions, et cetera. You should expect to encounter a random sequence of vignettes and questions testing different domains and areas of practice throughout the exam. A final thing to mention about the blueprint is that in addition to the items mapping to a domain and an area of practice, the items incorporate different client demographics and contexts. And you can expect to see items that reflect different objectives along the continuum of care, from preventative to maintenance to restorative, diverse client groups, as well as various practice settings. And this table is presented in the Blueprint document as a guideline for the PCE to ensure the exam reflects variety and is as close a representation as possible to the types of clients, scenarios, and practice settings that an entry to practice physiotherapist might encounter. Back to you, Nicole. All right. So, so that covered the structure, format, format, and content of the exam. So we'll now tackle some exam administration and delivery items. 
So the rhythm component is typically offered five times per year. And we've listed here all of the dates for 2023 on this slide. And this is also available on our website. So remote proctoring and in-center testing will be available for all administrations. And that's how we foresee that things are going to be um, in the future. So what's, no what's worth noting here is that the application deadlines are typically two months before the exam date. So just make sure that you are mindful of that as you're planning on when to take and apply for the exam. So everything that you need to know about applying for the exam is available in our updated registration guide. So we frequently update this. The last big update was made in March 2023, and we also made some amendments to this in the past month. So if you're in this stage of the process, feel free to check the, um, the updates that we've made to the registration guide, and it's available on our website. So to apply for the exam, we do still require that all documents be sent by mail and preferably by trackable mail. And we do not accept photocopied, faxed, or emailed applications. Just always make sure that your forms um, are complete and accurate as any errors may result in your application not being accepted or cause you significant delays in the process. So a few key things to note here is that your names must match. So the names that you have on your application form must match with the names on your identification. And the ID that you submit must be valid for the exam date. So one of the questions that we did get asked is, um, when is an el individual eligible to apply for the written component? So for candidates who are educated in Canadian entry to practice physiotherapy programs, you may attempt the written component in your final term of academic study, and that varies um, between the different programs. If you are, however, an internationally educated candidate, you may only attempt the written component after receiving a written confirmation of eligibility from the CAPR credentialing program, and you must also take your first attempt within two years of receiving your credentialing results letter. So more information about that is available in our exam eligibility policy, which is linked on this slide right here. So another thing to note is that you can only submit one application at a time or apply to one exam date at a time. You cannot apply for two exam dates simultaneously. And we also do not accept late applications. And what that means is anything received after the deadline date. Um, but a key thing to note is that we do process applications based on the received date. So even if you haven't heard from us soon after the deadline, as long as you know that your application was received within the deadline date, you are fine. So sometimes we do have backlogs with processing applications and we do have um, delays as well with our communications. And this typically happens around the time that is, it's close to the exam application deadline. So if your application is late, we do not automatically move late applications into the next exam date. That application package will be shredded and you must submit a new application. So one of the more frequently asked questions um, that we get is how will how will you know the TAPR has received your application? So we do not contact candidates to confirm that we have received an application. Um, the processing is confirmed only through your registration notice. However, you may contact us to confirm receipt of your application only if you do not receive a registration notice within 25 business days after you have mailed your application package. Great. So another piece that is somewhat related to exam applications is testing accommodations. So this piece doesn't apply to everyone. This is specifically for candidates who have a condition that impacts their ability to perform in a standardized exam. We offer testing accommodations to ensure that we are providing accessible and equitable services to all candidates. So for everyone's information, we do not ever alter the content of the exam, but what we do is we adjust the testing environment to ensure that everyone gets an equal opportunity to demonstrate their competence. 
Typically, accommodations requests are submitted with the exam application, but they can also be submitted at a later time. However, the deadline for supporting documents for attesting accommodations request is 30 business days before the exam date, and this is a hard deadline. Um, this is a hard deadline because this time frame just gives us sufficient time to review your application and make the necessary arrangements with our exam provider, Prometric. So if you are intending to submit an accommodations request, please make sure that you have carefully read the testing accommodations policy, the guidelines and the forms on our website. We updated all of these last year to ensure that we get the information that we require. So please just make sure that you tick all of the required boxes and complete all of the required fields. And this applies to your healthcare provider as well. So for everyone, once your application has been processed, you will receive a registration notice by email from CAPR. So that email will contain information on how to book your exam through Prometric, your client ID, and a link to book your exam seat. So when you book, you will be able to choose the exam delivery method, and that is um, either by remote proctoring or in center, the time, and the location as well if you're booking an, an exam in center. So this process is completely different for those with testing accommodations. But before we proceed with our registration guidelines, I'd first like to touch on first about Prometric. So what is Prometric? Who are they? So Prometric is our exam delivery partner. They are an assessment service provider that operates in many different countries, and they are specialized in computer-based examinations, which means they deliver exams on behalf of various professional organizations, academic institutions, and examining bodies and government agencies. So the services that they provide to us include administration, so that's test center and remote proctoring operations, um, exam delivery, uh, exam delivery, security, and some support as well for our candidates. So Prometric is a separate entity from CAPR and we do not have direct control over their systems and procedures, but we do communicate with them regularly to make sure that they are aware of our needs and requirements. So as for how to approach um, your exam registration, the key thing to note here is that it is very important that you book your seat early as some exam center seats fill up very quickly. So the test centers are in high demand. So don't wait to book your seat. The longer you wait, the less likely you are to get your preferred seat. Um, a question that we get asked about this as well is, when is the earliest time that one can apply for an exam? So, the, the earliest time that you can apply for an exam is essentially the year before. So exam dates are posted in July for the next year, and anyone can apply to that exam as soon as these exam dates are posted. However, seats can only be booked up to four months ahead of the exam date. So this is one of the things that we needed to change. It used to be that it was six months ahead. Now we've figured out that now we've identified with Prometric that the ideal time frame is four months ahead of your exam date. So if you are trying to book a seat and no available seats are showing up, there's that no availability found error message. What that means is that there are no available seats in that testing center at that time. So there are two um, things that could be happening here. The first is that seats are not yet available if you're trying to book the exam too early, or it could be that the seats are no longer available or at least not currently available. So what should you do when you see this error message? Um, the thing is that more seats can open up for a, an exam, but there is no guarantee, guarantee. So you can try to check the availability on the Prometric site regularly, um, even daily, because people don't get notified when seats um, become available. Um, and you can try to book an exam when they do become available. So just a point of clarification before we proceed to exam delivery. What you indicate on your exam application is simply your preference. So you're not bound to it by any means. 
So if you indicate in center and for a particular site on the form, but end up wanting to or needing to book um, a remote proctored appointment or change it to a different site, um, there is absolutely no issue and you do not need to tell us. You can just go ahead and book um, whatever seat is available. Things change, however, once you have committed and booked a seat. If you need to change, uh, if you need to make any changes to your appointments, we're still looking at that same exam day. Prometric charges and collects a rescheduling fee to, to make changes. Say you want to change the time of your exam or you want to change the site. Um, and this is unfortunately a fee that CAPR cannot waive as this is a prometric cost and the costs will vary depending on how far away from the exam date you are trying to make that change. Okay, so as Nicole has previously discussed, CAPR continues to use both in-center and remote proctoring for the written component. So regardless of whether you take the exam at a test center or in your own environment through remote proctoring, the exam is designed to be the same, the same experience, the same exact form, exam platform is used, and the same process for viewing the questions and submitting answers is the same. The main difference is with the screening process. It's more extensive for remote proctoring because the proctor needs to ensure the environment where you're taking the exam is secure and free from distraction. We have run um, actually 16 exam administrations to date. We just had a 16th um, two days ago using the dual modality. We have collected data on the exams we've run um, beginning August 2020 up to March 2023 and more than 5,000 candidates have taken the exam since we introduced remote proctoring. 42% of these candidates took the exam at a test center, whereas 58% used remote proctoring. We've been analyzing this data to determine whether there are any differences in exam performance based on modality. And what we found is that there are no differences in pass rates um, on, exam, on the exam based on delivery modality. Some questions that we've received from registrants, do we need to bring our own device? If you're taking the exam via remote proctoring, then yes, you're going to need to use your own device. If you're taking the exam at a test center, you'll use the device available um, at the site. There is no option for you to bring your own device to a test center. And another question we've received is, can I take the written component outside of Canada? And yes, this is now possible since we incorporated remote proctoring. Um, you have to take the exam through remote proctoring if you're taking it out of the country because all of our test centers are in Canada. After we administer each exam, we encourage candidates to complete an online feedback survey so we can collect important information about their exam experiences. And the link to access this survey is sent to Canada candidates within a few days of completing their exam. It asks questions about um, their experience taking the exam. And for candidates who've taken the exam through remote, remote proctoring, what we've learned is that candidates like the convenience and the comfort of being able to take the exam in a familiar environment. Many feel that being able to take the exam through remote proctoring has helped reduce any stress or anxiety associated with taking the exam. Also, many candidates have indicated that they appreciate the costs and time savings associated with remote proctoring as they no longer needed to travel to take their exam. What some candidates said they didn't like about the remote proctoring experience was the fear of running into technical issues during the exam. So that's another question we received. Are technical issues often a problem for remotely proctored exams? And the answer is no. Most candidates are able to take remotely proctored exams without running into issues. However, there are a small minority of candidates who do experience actual technical issues such as connectivity drops. And CAPR has protocols in place should you experience disruptions during your remotely proctored exam. The best way to ensure a smooth exam experience though is to make sure that you're adequately, adequately prepared for your remotely proctoring appointment. So if you're considering, or if you already know that you're going to be taking your exam through remote 
proctoring, you must read the remote proctoring resources on our website. This includes a candidate information package on remote proctoring of the written component. This is the best and most important resource covering everything you need to know about remote proctoring and what to expect on exam day. We also have a quick reference and troubleshooting guide. And this is a two page summary of the things that you need to know by heart about your remote proctoring appointment before the exam day. And finally, we have a resource on frequently asked questions about remote proctoring. We've also received questions regarding equipment requirements and room or setup environment, uh, what you can and cannot have in the room. And all of these questions are answered in the documents that I just mentioned. Also, Prometric has useful remote proctoring preparatory material on their Pro Proctor webpage. The What to Expect video is particularly useful. It shows a step-by-step -step process for getting ready and going through the remotely proctored environment. Um, candidate FAQ questions are also worth reading. And candidates taking the exam via remote proctoring, um, you must do a complete systems check to confirm that your device is working and the network will allow testing through ProProctor. Now this process won't run the exam software or platform. It just assesses if your, dev your device to see if it has the appropriate screen resolution, operating system, microphone, webcam, and, and network speed. This essentially just goes through a checklist. So make sure that you go through these processes well ahead of your scheduled exam date to give yourself enough time to address any issues. And finally, the Pro Proctor User Guide is a document with everything that you need to know and prepare on the Prometric side. It was last updated in December 2022, and it does have an appendix for Mac users who may have concerns about issues with remote proctoring using a Mac. So what happens if you do have issues during a remotely proctored exam? A common issue would be an unstable internet connection or loss of internet connectivity. So this is a very important consideration in planning where to take the exam. Ideally, you should be in a place where you can be hardwired to the network via an ethernet cable and ensure that no other devices or users in your location are connected to your network during the exam. But if you do lose connection during the exam, don't panic. You'll lose contact with your proctor and ex the exam time will pause. And then your progress will be saved. You'll be able to connect with Prometric's help desk via live chat for assistance. There is a live chat function on each of your screens and you should still be able to use that if you get disconnected. And once you're able to reconnect, you'll need to complete another security check with the proctor and then you continue from where you left off and the timer starts again. Now CAPR unfortunately cannot help you with technical difficulties on exam day. So the, the best source of assistance will be Prometric. However, if you experience technical difficulties that Prometric is unable to resolve, then you must contact us directly through the CSC underscore exams email. And this notifies you, uh, sort of, sorry, it notifies us that you're no longer able to continue with your exam. And CIPR needs to know this as soon as possible so that we can investigate the cause. Again, it's not because CIPR can help you reconnect. Essentially, it means your exam has stopped and you're, we need to reschedule you for the next available administration. All right, so now on to exam preparation items. So we've listed here the key CAPR resources that you must review before taking the exam. So all, again, all of the items here are linked to the relevant documents. Um, but alternatively, you can also access the preparing for the exam page on our website as that also contains all of the relevant resources for the written component. So the first item on the list is the VPCE blueprint. So as Kelly mentioned, the blueprint is essentially the recipe for the exam. So if you're if you, you're not sure about the content and the structure of the exam, um, this is the key uh, document to refer to. Everything that is and can be covered is there. So make sure that you 
have read this document, you are familiar with it, um, to understand the scope and the content of the exam. So the next item is the PCE key reference list. So this is the list of resources. So all of the textbooks and documents that are used by CAPR and the item writers to develop and maintain questions in the PCE looking component item bank. Um, everything is listed there. So the third item is the written component information session, which is this session that you are attending right now. So every year we host at least one session and the recording of the most recent session will always be available on our website. Next is the essential guide for candidates. It's bolded here because it's likely that um, you haven't seen that yet because this is a, a pretty recent, a recently updated document. And what this is essentially is a handbook for preparing for the PCE. It's kind of like a, a companion document for this session, since most of the uh, topics that we cover today are in there. But in addition, you will also find in there some studying tips, test taking tips, as well as an introduction to the computer-based platform. And what that is, is basically we've put in screenshots of the tutorial that you will go through before the exam on exam day. But, but you can access them so that you can see how the exam platform looks like and the, the functionalities that will be available to you on exam day. So the next thing is the candidate information package for remote proctoring. Kelly has all, already mentioned this. So this is a must read for anyone taking the exam via remote proctoring or if you're considering Taking the exam via remote proctoring this is a fantastic resource because it has everything that you need to know and prepare for a remote proctored exam. The next one is the written component practice questions. Um, we did get asked if we have any sets of previous exams that are available for exam preparation. And unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have that type of resource available for candidates. Um, but what we have right now is um, this sample document that has 50 written component questions. These are all retired questions. And what that means is that these questions appeared in previous exams and exams in the past, but they're no longer in the CAPR active item bank. So these questions are representative of the content that you will encounter during the exam. Although the, um, the current sampling of 50 questions are not balanced to the blueprint, it's still a great resource, resource as this will help you get familiarized with the, with the language style and the types of questions on the written component. So basically the layout and the language. And lastly, we have the written component practice exam, um, which is another incredibly useful resource for anyone taking the exam. Another question that we got asked a lot is, um, will you be able to log in or access the platform ahead of time to kind of see and experience the platform or even just see how the exam is formatted, how it appears on screen? Um, at the moment, the only way to experience the exam platform before exam day is through the practice exam. So this is a paid service that you can avail of through Prometric. It's about $57 Canadian, and it is available in English and French. So you can book a remote proctored or an in-center exam, and it basically enables you to go through the entire exam process, the full testing experience. So what that means is that if you book a remotely proctored practice exam, you will go through all of the steps, you will connect with the proctor, you will run the, the, the exam on your device, you'll go through the process of identity verification, the environmental scan, you'll do all of the checks, you'll go through the tutorial, and then you'll go through the sample test. So there are sample questions there, and then you will do the security checkout at the end. And then for the in-center practice exam, you'll get to rehearse your timings for travel, you'll go, you'll go to the test center where you intended to test, and you'll go through the entire security check-in and check-out process as well. And you'll be able to use the test center computers 
for the sample exam, uh, sorry, for the, for the practice exam, um, if that's something that, which can be very valuable, if that's something that um, gives you a bit of anxiety um, before exam day. So this practice exam has the same 50 questions that I mentioned in that previous document, the written component practice questions, and you will have one hour of access to this um, practice exam. So the timing is sort of the same as the actual exam, just, just reduced by a quarter. So instead of having four hours to answer 200 questions, you'll have one hour to answer 50. A key thing to note here, though, is that your performance in the practice exam is not designed to show you how you will perform in the actual exam. The main objective of this is to just give you an idea of how the questions are presented and experience the platform, experience the, um, the testing experience before exam day and basically move through the questions. So it will get you oriented to all of the tools. Um, the things that we mentioned in the essential guide. So that includes flagging, highlighting questions or highlighting text, striking out options, reviewing items, going back and forth between questions and taking notes. So we highly encourage everyone to go through the process of the practice exam. So another key thing that we get asked about um, exam preparation is um, how do you manage your exam preparation time? Um, unfortunately, this is not something that we can be very prescriptive about since the candidates who take the written component are incredibly diverse. Everyone's needs and demands on the demands on your lives are incredibly different. So it's really up to you to reflect on your current needs, your needs for the exam. And a great tool for this, again, is the blueprint. So you can check which items you would feel, which items or areas you feel deficient in, and balance that um, with the demands of your life and create a plan around that. So again, if you need um, more study tips or test taking tips, we have that covered in the essential guide for candidates. And some other useful external resources that we'd like to um, draw your attention to. Um, the first one is the, the competency profile. This is the document from which the blueprint is, is based on. Next is the National Physiotherapy Entry to Practice Curriculum Guidelines. Um, this may also be useful since this describes the recommended elements of the academic and clinical content of a Canadian entry to practice physiotherapy program. So it's a good thing to refer to as well. For internationally educated PTs, there are four bridging programs across the country. And while they're not directly aimed as PCE preparation programs, these courses are very helpful to help you um, become more familiar with Canadian physiotherapy practice, which is of course essential um, in the exam. And for everyone, UBC has a physio refresh written program, and I believe their schedules are based on CAPR's exam dates, so that's um, worth checking. We did also get asked questions about PCE prep courses. What are our thoughts on that? Um, so we are aware that there are various written preparatory programs that we can take for a fee. Um, however, we do not endorse any of the various PCE prep courses that you can take online or in other modes. Um, the individuals and groups that um, develop these courses are not affiliated with CAPR and the resources that they produce are not sanctioned by CAPR. So if you do engage with them, please, please engage with them and please re resources with caution. Um, because again, they're not really CAPR sanctioned resources. All right, so now let's talk about exam day. So the written component exam day is typically four and a half hours of, uh, in duration. So that's four hours of exam time and the 0.5, that remaining half hour, factors in the check-in, uh, the, the agreements that you need to sign, the tutorial, and the security processes that you need to go through. So um, 
we just mentioned that so that you can ensure that you plan your day accordingly. But please don't be confused. You will only have four hours of access to the exam. So we recommend that you arrive on site or be ready for exam launch early if you're taking the exam via remote proctoring. Um, ideally, you should be about 30, ready 30 minutes ahead of the scheduled start time. Because if you are late, so that's about 30 minutes after the start time, you will not be granted access to the exam and your exam fee will be forfeited. So regardless of how you take the exam, we've already mentioned this multiple times, there is a screening to get in and there's screening to get out. Um, and you will have to go through the security processes anytime you take a break or anytime you step away from your testing environment. If you want more details about the, the processes and the rules that you're bound to on exam day, please review the rules of conduct and examination security. These, um, th this is available at the very end of the most recent version of the registration guide. All right, so everyone is allowed to take washroom breaks during the exam or any other breaks, um, whether you're taking the exam in center or whether you're taking the exam by remote proctoring. The key thing to note here is that your exam timer will not stop during this time. So any time that you take away, including the time that you need for the security processes, will be de deducted from your exam time. Um, and another keynote, because we did get asked some questions about the test, uh, what test taking features will be available to you on exam day. I've already mentioned that you can flag questions, you can highlight text, you can strike out options, you can take notes, and you can skip questions and go back. And you also have a way to review all items um, at any time during the exam. So about taking notes, if you write the exam in center, you will be provided with a pen and paper for any thoughts that you need to write down during the exam. However, if you write the exam via remote proctoring, you are not allowed to have pen and paper in your testing environment. And the reason for this is that you are not allowed to take anything out of the exam environment. In CAPR and Prometric, we have no way to ensure the secure handling and disposal of exam content outside the outside a secure exam platform. So you will be able to use instead a scratch pad on the exam platform to take notes if you are taking the exam via remote proctoring. So if things are still unclear and if you have if you still have questions about what you can and cannot do during the exam, please again review the rules of conduct and examination security that I mentioned not too long ago. All right. Um, and as for readiness on exam day. If you, if you feel ill or experience any other extraordinary circumstance ahead of exam day, or if you have any other concern that may affect your performance in the exam, you are strongly encouraged to not attempt the exam and reschedule if you have enough time or withdraw. Because if you fail, you cannot claim circumstances before exam day in an application for administrative reconsideration. So Kelly will discuss this. Um, in a bit more detail later. As for no-shows, if you do not show up for your exam without notice, you will forfeit your exam fee, but we will make um, considerations for partial refunds in the event of severe illness or um, any other extraordinary circumstances. Um, more details about this are available again on our registration guide. All right, back to you, Kelly. Okay, now we're going to talk about the exam scoring process. So after the exam, your responses are machine scored and tabulated. All questions are equally weighted. One mark is given if you answer the question correctly and zero marks if you answer the question incorrectly. There are no deductions for any incorrect responses. Your total score on the exam is equal to the sum of your correct responses. Now, as part of our scoring process, we always conduct a psychometric evaluation after the exam 
to evaluate how each question on the exam performed, as well as how the exam overall performed. And these analyses are used to verify the soundness of each question from a statistical perspective prior to scoring the exam. And as I mentioned before, each exam form consists of a different sampling of 200 multiple choice questions. And we're constantly refreshing the exam bank so that exams always have some new questions that have not yet been tried out, as well as questions that have been used in the past. So it's important that we continually monitor the performance of questions to ensure each question is fair and appropriate to, um, to count towards a candidate's score. And the statistical analyses that we run help diagnose whether there might be any issues with a question. We look at the difficulty of each question, how well performance on a question correlates with performance on the exam overall, and the pattern of response options for each question. Um, for instance, how many candidates are selecting each distractor. Any questions that are not performing as expected are flagged for review by an external committee, committee a registered physiotherapist who work in collaboration with CAPR. For example, if a high percentage of test takers select an incorrect response for a question, this question would be flagged because it might indicate that there's a problem with the clarity of the question, or perhaps it's not testing entry-level content when we thought it was, or maybe the answer identified as correct is not the best answer. The external committee would review the questions that we identify as having unusual psychometric properties. They review the statistics associated with the question and any data on how the questions the question might have performed in the past, and they review the reference material associated with each question. And the, the reference material is what the subject matter experts creating the material are using to verify the soundness of the, the question and answer and the appropriateness of it for an entry to practice perspective. The committee then uses this information to decide whether the question should be included in scoring, removed from scoring, or rekeyed, whereby the correct answer is changed or by more than one option is selected and accepted as correct. Typically for, for each exam, there are a few items that we remove from scoring or that we double key or rekey because we determine that they're not fair to be used on an exam, either because the statistics show that they were too difficult or there was something else to suggest that they may not be fair. Once we've scored the exam, we need to determine who has passed and who has failed. And we do this by establishing a passing score or a cut score for the exam. The passing score is established using a criterion reference standard setting methodology. We use a method known as the modified Angoff method, which is one of the most widely used procedures for establishing performance standards on licensure exams, particularly for multiple choice licensure exams. But what is standard setting? So this is a process used to determine an acceptable level of performance for an exam. And it's conducted using a panel of expert physiotherapists from across the country who are familiar with the requirements of entry to practice physiotherapy and who determine the minimum level of acceptable performance required to practice safely and effectively. It's important to know that your exam result is based on whether or not you meet or exceed the standard of minimal competence. Your result is not based on how well other candidates perform on the exam. In other words, we don't use a bell curve in order to ensure that a certain percentage of candidates will pass or fail. And once the standard is set, we use a process called equating to ensure that the same passing standard is upheld for each exam. Equating mathematically adjusts the passing score for each exam to account for any variations in the difficulty of each exam form. This means that the score that would be needed to pass the exam on one administration might differ for the, from the score needed to pass on a different administration. And equating, it ensures that the same passing standard is consistently applied for each administration and that candidates are not advantaged or disadvantaged based on the set of questions they receive on their exam and their difficulty level. 
We've received some questions from candidates asking um, how many points they need to pass the exam and whether they need to pass each component to pass the exam. By each component, we mean um, each area of the blueprint. Um, so there is only one overall passing score for the exam. It's based on your total score. There is no minimum score that you need for each domain or for each area of practice. As for the number of points that you need to pass the exam, this is not something that we publish as it varies from exam to exam based on the specific questions selected for the exam and their difficulty level, as well as the number of questions that are ultimately scored on the exam. What I can tell you though, is that on average, the passing score typically varies between around 65 to 70%, which means that on average, you would need to answer about 65 to 70% of questions correct to pass the exam. Again, that's just the average trend um, historically. Before releasing the results, we convert candidates' scores to scaled scores so that they can be interpreted in a, a consistent manner across different administrations of the exam. The scaled score range that we use is 200 to 800 with a passing score of 600. Now it's important to note that transforming your scores from raw scores to scaled scores, it doesn't change the interpretation of whether or not you've passed the exam. So if your raw score on the exam or the number of points you obtained meets or exceeds the raw passing score, which is the number of points that you would need to obtain to pass, your scaled score will also meet or exceed the scaled passing score. I'm gonna give you an example of how we convert raw scores to scaled scores um, and how they can be interpreted. So I've created an example of two hypothetical candidates taking the written component on two different dates. So this means each candidate is getting a different sampling of 200 questions on their exam. Let's assume that candidate one takes form A and candidate two takes form B. Let's also assume that candidate one obtains a raw score of 150 out of a maximum possible score of 200, whereas candidate two obtains a raw score of 145 out of a maximum possible score of 198. So for form B, you can see two items were removed from scoring. Based on this information, which candidate performed better? Well, if you were to calculate the percentage of questions answered correctly, you would see that candidate one answered 75% 75 correctly, whereas candidate two answered 73% correctly. So you might assume candidate one performed better on their exam. But remember, not all exams are of equal difficulty. So what if I were to tell you that candidate two received a slightly more difficult exam form than candidate one? And now you can see that through a criterion reference standard setting process, the raw passing score for form A was determined to be 138 out of 200, whereas the raw passing score for form B was 132 out of 198, which means form B was more difficult than form A. So now how do we compare the candidates? In order to control for differences in form difficulty and make accurate comparisons across the different administrations, we transform the raw scores to a common scale. And once we convert the raw scores to scaled scores, the difference in exam form difficulty disappear. And now you can see that these candidates for form A and B have the same passing score. We also learn that score, a score of 150 on form A is actually equivalent to a score of 145 on form B. So both candidates have the same scale score of 639. So while this is just an illustration, it's a hypothetical example, we hope that it helps you understand how scale scores are used and meant to be interpreted. All right, so once the results are ready for release, we send them to candidates through email. Candidates receive a score report that indicates their pass or fail status, as well as their scaled total score and their scaled subscores in each domain and area of practice. Note that we no longer send results through regular mail. The results are released to both candidates and regulators within six weeks of the exam date. 
For Canadian physiotherapy students or graduates, we also will share the results with the Canadian university programs. They receive an annual academic report that provides a breakdown of how students from their program performed compared to students from other Canadian programs. Note that your individual results are only sent to the program if you give consent. This is something you, that you would do upon registration for the written component. If you don't give your consent, then your exam results are only included in aggregate form, but your individual results that identify you are not included. Uh, so if a regulator requests to verify your exam status as part of your application for a license to practice, um, please complete the form available on our website and submit it to us through the exams at alliancept.org email. It's listed here on this slide and CAPR will process and send your verification directly to the relevant regulatory college within 10 business days. So what happens if you are unsuccessful on the exam? If you fail, then you can repeat the exam on a different date. You would do this by submitting an application for the next available administration of the written component. It's definitely not going to be the next immediate administration as the applica application deadline would have passed. Um, note that we do have a limit on the number of attempts you can make, which is standard for almost all licensure exams. If your first attempt at the written component was in or after 2013, you have a maximum of three attempts to pass the exam. You are referred to as a Section A candidate. If, however, your first attempt was before 2013, you are referred to as a Section B candidate and have five attempts to pass, as was the policy at that time. Also, if you're unsuccessful on your attempt, you can request a rescore of your results for a fee. Information about requesting a rescore is provided in your results package if you're unsuccessful. Now, the purpose of a rescoring is to ensure that the candidate receives credit for all correct answers. It's important to note that it's very, very unlikely that a candidate's rescore will ever, will ever differ from their actual original result, and this is because of the extensively extensive quality assurance steps taken to ensure accuracy and in scoring, including two different testing experts who are conducting an independent scoring of the results and confirming a 100% match before we release any results. In the off chance that your exam result ever did change from a fail to a pass, the rescoring fee would be refunded and note that the request for a rescoring must be made within 30 days of the results release. Also available to you if you are unsuccessful on the exam, you have the option of applying for an administrative reconsideration or an AR. ARs are for incidents that affect a candidate's ability to perform their best on exam day due to circumstances that were beyond their control. Now, we do have very strict criteria about what counts as an AR, and you can find details in our AR policy. Um, but in general, there are three different categories. One pertains to illness on the day of the exam. Another pertains to administrative issues on the day of the exam. And a third pertains to other extraordinary circumstances, such as family emergency. A few things to note, however. If you do experience ill health or any extraordinary circumstances before the exam, we encourage you to withdraw from the exam and fees would apply. If you experience illness on the day of the exam, then we need to be informed of this illness within seven days of the exam date. This is before your results would be released. If your results then indicate that you fail once you do get them, you can proceed to submit an AR. Now for the other two categories, the administrative issues and extraordinary circumstances, you are not required to inform CAPR of these issues until after the results release. Now AR submissions must be made within 30 days of the results release. Just a note about supporting documentation. If you believe there was an administrative issue that impacted your ability to perform well on exam day, you need to provide evidence that there was an occurrence or an admission 
on exam day that deviated significantly from CAPR exam administration standards or procedures. And as for extraordinary circumstances, if you know something that may impact your ability to perform well on the exam with enough time that you should have withdrawn from the exam before the exam date, it's unlikely the AR will be granted. If you do, an, if you do apply for an AR and CAPR determines that the issues that you identified could have significantly affected your results, then an AR may be granted. And if an AR is granted, your exam result will not be counted in your exam history. For instance, if you failed on your first attempt, then submitted an AR that ends up being granted, that exempt is no, attempt is no longer included and your next attempt will count as your first attempt. Note that the um, results of an AR never change your exam result from a fail to a pass. All right, finally, for those who pass the exam, uh, what do you do? Well, first of all, congratulations. We sincerely hope that this is the case for everyone. Um, once you receive your notification that you've successfully completed the written component, you should contact the regulator in the province or territory where you wish to be licensed for further details about the process to become fully licensed. And that concludes our information session. On behalf of Nicole and myself, we thank you so much for your interest in learning more about the exam and for attending today's session.